Hello, Malaysia and followers from around the world, especially in Australia, UK, Singapore, and Thailand. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected everyone in the world, and this includes our children. Teaching and learning has gone online for the past two years. It's a big challenge for the stakeholders, whether they are parents, teachers, students, and of course, the school itself. Online studying looks like it's here to stay. But how do we deal with the situation? How do we improve ourselves? How do schools cope with this new method of teaching? Our guests for tonight are Greg and Shanna Perry, the tech team. But I will introduce Shanna first. She is the Senior Education Director of Kingsgate International School. She's a prominent educational leader and has worked in the United States, Middle East, India, and China, serving as a director for higher education, as well as a headmaster of a secondary school and a consultant in 2018 and 2019. Shanna has identified, or rather has been picked as a top 30 global gurus around the world's best. It's not just a guru, but a global guru, okay? <laughs> and Greg is the co-founder of Kingsgate International School and is the CEO and co-founder of Kingsgate Education Management Company, the Global Services in Education, GSE. He has vast experiences, including high-level positions with secondary and vocational institutions throughout Australia, the Middle East, India, and China. He has trained teachers and principals throughout the world in areas such as critical thinking, language development, and leadership. His expertise includes school startup projects, leadership, and curriculum development. They have lived in Malaysia for the past five years. And believe me, they know where to get the best eating stalls in PJ and in KL. Okay, so, so they really know Malaysia and what kind of uh, demands that has been made by parents and teachers and students in Malaysia. Welcome on board, guys. Thank, Thank you so much for having us. Let's shoot the uh, first question. The COVID-19 pandemic has, of course, uh, forced a lot of schools to close. For more than 100 days in the case of uh, Malaysia, classes has been disrupted. In the case of Malaysia, there has been complaints of Wi-Fi connectivity, and it happens all around the world. And for many, uh, how, what is the general reception in the, of schools, uh, teachers, parents, and students for the past uh, two years? How have they been coping yeah, well, certainly, um, I mean, no credible person can genuinely say that virtual learning is anywhere as good as face-to-face, -face, of course. I mean, as human beings, we are social animals. Uh, we, we, we crave human connection and, and meeting people in person is really important. Yeah. But the truth is, schools were already on a trajectory of change. Um, the pandemic removed a lot of the barriers and excuses because we didn't have any choice. Overnight, someone said, change immediately, you must go virtual. Um, and the truth is for good schools, it just accelerated plans and directions that were already in motion. Um, some schools succeeded and of course some schools failed. Yeah. But the pandemic accelerated changes that really in some ways tested our assumptions about what we thought could work. Um, we were dealing with, I mean, our children are digital natives. And yeah. what's actually happened is that these assumptions we thought might work were quickly tested and we're seeing the results of that now. It's good schools were already preparing for hybrid learning because with digital natives as our students, we knew that that was the future of education and that's our students' future. So good schools already had it in motion. It definitely sped everything up quickly. But um, yeah, like Greg said, it was a trajectory that good schools and good educators were already on. Uh, I've got uh, nephews who are still in school. Okay, I'm old school. When I was in school, I was quite a dreamer. My mind used to drift away, okay? I lost my attention in school, in classes, okay, now. Um, I always wonder, okay, I've got these kids locked up in a room, okay? They have always been locked up anyway, even without the, even before the pandemic, they're always in the rooms, okay, with the computers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
now. Okay, as a parent, how would I know that these kids are actually learning? Would they be uh, tempted by this, what they call it, this little tendency to look at the handphones, uh, playing with games, you know, watching uh, some clips from YouTube instead of paying attention in class? Okay, class. So how do teachers uh, handle the situation? You know, if, if you are in, in a physical class, the teachers can really tell whether you're paying attention or not. But in a virtual learning, how do teachers cope with this situation? Yeah, I mean, you're right. Um, when I was a, a child, looking yeah. out, uh, drifting off meant looking out the window. Um, in 2021, the dreamers are online. <laughs> <laughs> they're reaching out to friends on social media. They're connecting with others, checking out TikTok. So it certainly is a different time. Yeah. Um, I guess, though, when teachers lead curriculum in a virtual environment, it's not passive, though, as people might assume. It's not a passive process. It requires students to engage collaboratively. It's not just talking on a screen. That's not what virtual yeah. schooling looks like, not best practice anyway. Okay. We would argue that accountability is actually easier in the mm -hmm. sense that everything is documented in a virtual world. Everything's occurring and being documented in that space. Uh, the activities, the tasks, they're all communicated through the platforms, the messaging systems. Um, look, dreamers are, are not always off task. Sometimes they're off task at the wrong time. And the reality is that they're not conventional in their approach. Mm -hmm. um, but what virtual environments allow, though, is time to be more flexible. Mm -hmm. The truth is a 16-year-old can complete their tasks at 11 p.m. at night if they choose to, even though that's not convention of maybe their 40-year-old parents. <laughs> um, they have the flexibility, the environment is created so that they can have spaces and times throughout the day. I mean, the truth is we all daydream um, and we need those brain breaks. It just can't disrupt the learning process. And that's what's so important about this. You know, we, we talk about students being creative. That daydreaming is part of that creativity. You know, so especially if they're sitting there, you know, learning about a robot in class and they start daydreaming about all the other things robots could do or what kind of robot they would create. So that's you know, really where that creative space is in that daydreaming world. So daydreaming isn't so bad. Uh, Greg and Shanna, I wish that you were my teachers during my school days. <laughs> <laughs> I, remember, I, remember, I remember the flying duster flying across me, okay? That was daydreaming. Okay. And, and look, if I can add, we have strategies in a virtual environment as well. I mean, the truth is the teacher can zoom in on a, on a child. There are a range okay. of technology uh, devices that can be used. It just looks very, very different. But if you can imagine if you're a 15-year-old and suddenly your, your camera comes alive and the teacher zooms in, it's just okay. the same, same, but different. <laughs> okay. My next question is, uh, don't ask me to make any confession, okay? I'm just going to ask this, okay? How do you teachers prevent online cheating during exam? Well, that's a very good question. And there are a couple of different ways. So first of all, there's a strong value system that we hope that students carry with them into exams as well as their everyday life. So a strong value system is important, but there are ways for teachers to know that students' work is their work. And the first way is how teachers test. You know, we talk a lot in education about the different levels of learning. And the very basic levels of learning are just remembering and understanding. Those are very, very basic. Do you know the words on the page and do you understand what you're reading? It's everything above that that we really want teachers testing in. And that's the application of what they learn. And that's harder to cheat on. That's not looking up a yeah. date you know, of, of, of a country being formed. So testing at that application and above level is so important. You know, what can students do with the information they've learned? You know, can they analyze it? Can they create new things from it? Can they evaluate it and make justifications about the knowledge that they now have? So that's really where we want teachers testing students. You know, you have teachers doing informal assessments, checks for understanding, asking questions. So generally tests aren't a time where teachers are surprised with what students know. You know, usually that's being built up from every day, making sure students are on the right track and understanding that information as well. Uh, Greg, ideally, uh, how much time should a student spend in front of the computer for virtual class? 
Oh, look, that really is a difficult question. We often get asked this question, and, and, and maybe I ask that of you as an adult, how much time is okay for you? <laughs> it, it's funny how the world has changed. Um, I see parents often very critical about screen time for academic time, Mm-hmm. But then they're allowing their children to be in video games. I can see them walking down the mall, holding the, the telephone, playing games at the age of four or five. So it's an interesting perspective. I'm not particularly scared of screen time. What I'm focused on is balance. We want interesting children. I mean, let me put it another way. What about the child who spends six hours a day buried in a book in their bedroom with no social connections with other people? Is that healthy? Or is it unhealthy to be online and looking at a screen, socially engaged with friends about a common topic using a range of different instruments? So look, I I think there should be some balance. I don't think there should be too much screen time. I think maybe a couple of hours a day is is more reasonable. But the truth is we can be quite hypocritical in our approach to this. We've got to remember that the screen's not some kind of scary device. It's just a tool. And I think that's the perspective that we need to, to have on these kinds of things. Uh, you know that the uh, whether we use Zoom or other um, platforms, uh, we can tell that actually it, it, they are just uh, communications uh, tools. You know, they are not really uh, made for education or teaching. Uh, they are just uh, some tools that we use to talk and to get uh, schools to teach uh, via Zoom and Google. Mm-hmm. Um, what would be the uh, kind of hybrid teaching platforms that would be ideal for? online teaching in the years to come up, even now? If, if, if I can start, and maybe Shannon can jump in, because I know Shannon's been doing some recent work on this, but we're currently working with a number of groups who are setting up virtual schools around the world. Um, and the truth is, there's a location of a teacher, and there's multiple locations of the students in all different parts of the world. The location doesn't matter. But we often believe in a blended mode of learning, where there's sometimes screen time, and there's sometimes independent work um, off the side. So it should be a balance of, of modes and mediums. It's not just about one, one mode alone. Shanna? There, we can't go back. You know, we can't pretend that this year and a half, two years hasn't happened. So we can't just go back to what learning looked like then. We've learned too much over these last two years. You know, we've had an opportunity to work with a lot of resources and a lot of online resources that are really, really valuable and good. And so we want to take what we've learned and take those positive things and move those into the classrooms now. Hybrid learning isn't going to go anywhere, but it it, it will be more relevant in context. It won't be as, you know, we can't leave our homes for online learning. But we need to make sure that we're using the tools that are in front of us. We have digital native students who are digitally nimble and we need to teach them how to use the internet. There's a lot of false information out there on the internet. So we need to make sure that we're teaching students how to use internet responsibly and how to take what's on the internet and continue to be creative and innovative. You know, what's next in technology? That's where we want our students. We want them in that space where they're part of creating their future. So it's, you know, it's, it's interesting to watch as everything unfolds and what will come out of this but I'm very hopeful that what's going to come out of this is uh, our schools that are, are more in line with how our students learn. You know, Greg, the uh, positive part of the COVID-19 pandemic is that it has forced schools to change and adapt, to reboot the system, so to speak. Um, many uh, teachers who may not have adopted this kind of teaching are not forced to do it. Uh, they have realized that it's just, it's just not the standing in front of the camera and to start teaching. They have realized they have got to prepare, spend a lot of time preparing materials and that uh, is different from physical uh, class teaching. But it has also led to a divide, a digital divide in rural areas and among the uh, poorer sectors of Malaysians, for example, they can't even afford a tablet and they have to uh, ask their kids to use the mobile phone uh, to follow an online class. Now, um, top of the issue is that um, for schools or in areas where people are poor or from rural areas, how does one actually start a virtual school for a start? Yeah, so um, I know Shan has been doing a lot of research on this recently, and she's been working on a project in some remote areas, so she can really add lots to support this. But if I can take up your first point, 
You're yeah. right. It's been really difficult for teachers, um, for our expatriate teachers. Many of our teachers, they haven't seen families for two years because they haven't been able to travel home. Yeah. They're in their apartments and they, they're quite isolated. They're spending time with seven-year-olds all day and they can't interact with their friends. Mm -hmm. So it's quite stressful and they work 12, 14-hour days because they're trying to prepare materials in multiple ways. Mm -hmm. And how you teach children that are seven years old is different how you teach children at 16, arguably much harder for the younger children. So very much there's a lot of time and energy put into crafting these materials. And you're right, it's particularly difficult if the families at home don't have the technology and the devices. I don't know, Shanna's been working on this more recently. Yeah, that digital divide is, is so real. And a lot of countries have done it really, really well. And they've done things like open up TV stations and radio stations for students mm -hmm. without internet, but they can log on. And channel 501 is year three, a, a year three teacher teaching you know, how to read or teaching history or geography. So a lot of countries have done this really, really incredibly. And it's something we all need to continue to work on because even when we're back in face-to-face -face classes, we still want to use, you know, use these programs and these opportunities as an extension for learning for those students who don't have internet. But you know, providing opportunities you know, with, with what they do have, providing hard copies of materials when we can, you know, making sure that we are including everyone in the learning process and we're not leaving anyone behind to maybe catch up later. For Asians, there's always this perception and impression that uh, in terms of Wi-Fi connectivity mm -hmm. and even this uh, digital divide, it's, it mostly happens in um, Asia. But I know for a matter of fact that in rural areas in Canada, in Australia, mm -hmm. and in US, they have this uh, kind of uh, digital divide. Can you share with us uh, some of these problems that uh, the countries in US and uh, in Australia, how do they cope with it? Yeah, absolutely. So my sister is an elementary principal back in America and her, her student population, over 80% of them did not have access to internet. And so what some of the areas did um, and some of the businesses did in her area was they actually set up Wi-Fi hotspots. So they used school buses and parked them in various locations around her community. So students could have a free access to the internet. And I heard a lot of this happening in Canada and Australia as well. Um, my sister uh, for her school, I know she talked a lot about, you know, not putting attachments with emails because that's so much data that's taken up. So to include everything in that email body, those plain text, um, you know, and, and phone calls to students, not only to see if they need help with their homework, but also throughout this time, especially balancing work output with well-being. A great view from Australia. What is it like in Darwin, for example? Well, to be honest, the internet is getting better and better in Australia. And those central hubs, the internet is quite good. But as Shanna said, the, the internet um, can't always be relied on in multiple places. Having said that, I spoke to my, my family just this morning via, uh, on my iPhone in a quite an isolated part of Australia. But what, that, what we'll often do in Australia is we'll also make sure that the technology can be available offline. So the material can be sent. I mean, back in the day, it was CD-ROMs, but now it's via um, USBs. And the children can operate the computers without having to access the internet. So there's a range of ways of doing it without having to connect to that cloud, that cloud-based that, that online platform. Google Docs did that and made um, a lot of their material available offline, which was great. What about uh, teaching that requires uh, hands-on teaching and learning, such as uh, vocational training? How would uh, online classes uh, fit? in this uh, era of uh, the pandemic? You know, it just fits because it's, it's even as adults who didn't grow up this way is how we're learning. It's just yeah. like with anything else, you know, we are, we're all going online to find things. We're not opening books to read about plumbing. <laughs> so yeah. all of the demonstrations are there. So that's that student centered classroom, it doesn't matter what kind of classroom it is, it's, it's vital and needed for every single subject area. So it's like learning how to cook uh, by watching YouTube video clips. Drain it. Drain it. 
What's she doing? What's she doing? Drain the oh my god! Absolutely, <laughs> I, I learned so much from from YouTube and video clips. <laughs> we were we were actually just discussing this this morning um, during the pandemic. I'm not sure about you, but a lot of adults learned a lot of things. Absolutely, um, uh, Bitcoin and the crypto currency platform has been huge in the last year. Mm-hmm. Go down to a bookshop and buy a book, or how yeah. did you learn about it? You know, we accessed videos online. We we participated in online forums. We read articles. That's how adults choose to learn now. Yeah. And I guess we need to remember that this is the best way for children to learn as well, using a range of different modes and mediums. And also we scale in at our area of interest. We start at a superficial level just to understand the basics. And if we get hooked and engaged and excited, we dig down deeper. And that's how we teach children virtually as well. Uh, for the past two years, thanks to such online teaching, whether through YouTube or some other platforms, I've, I've had enough uh, burnt cheesecakes, okay? <laughs> <laughs> me too, me too. <laughs> Is that the only bakery lessons that they have on YouTube? <laughs> I've seen seven-year-olds separate their own DNA and put it in a vial. Now, of course, you need a microscope to see that, but using basic uh, 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 detergents and chemicals from a household, you can do things like that. So it's surprising. It's just about knowing how to navigate these spaces and understanding it's real life in real purpose. So it's, it's, we just need to learn how to do this. And we also just need to embrace it because it's, it's our reality and it's our future. So just embrace it and, you know, recognize that this is not only how students learn, but this is how we're now learning how to do different things, including burning cheesecake. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. And Shana, you have spent a lot of time in China, uh, in India and other parts of uh, Asia. Uh, I would like to move away from the subject of uh, online uh, classes for a little while, okay, to just ask you about the kind of methodology, the type of teaching in Asia and the expectations of Asians, okay? You know that in Asia, there's a lot of uh, memorizing. That's the approach. I mean, it produces a lot of Asians who are very good in math. People think Asians are geniuses and good at math because uh, we are. I, I was one of those people who didn't do very well in maths, okay? So I had, uh, my options were uh, a little bit uh, different, okay? <laughs> so, but um, memorizing is definitely not part of the kind of teaching that you would uh, encourage uh, kids. Um, you want your kids to, to think, to be able to think independently, and of course, uh, to understand what they are studying. Uh, can you share with us the expectations of Asians and for educators like you with experiences in India, China, everywhere. How do you tell parents that, look, uh, there are many ways of teaching your kids. It's not just memorizing to pass exams. Yeah, and, and, and keep in mind, when, earlier when I was talking about Bloom's taxonomy, that, that reading understanding level is the foundation. Like students have to, they have to know some things. They have to have that academic knowledge background foundation. But that's when they need to start applying it. You know, doctors have a lot they have to memorize, but then they need to be able to apply it. So they need to be able to take it off the page. They need to be able to evaluate, which is a very high level thinking skill. So they've got to quickly move out of the textbook and into real life, which is application and evaluating and, and applying and, and, and analyzing. So, so that, that foundation is important, but that next step is, that's what makes it the magic happen right there. Mm. You know, talking about parents, and it is, it's, it's different how a lot of us grew up and how a lot of us learned, but this is why you have to take parents on the journey with you. You know, I, I'm passionate about, you know, parent meetings and parent workshops, explaining to them how their children are learning, which I think a lot of parents have now heard it you know, in the next room on the screen. So they have a better understanding of how teachers teach and how their child learns. But it's really important to explain to parents, here's why we teach similarities and differences. And here's the interconnectedness of thoughts and thinking. You know, here's how your child processes information. So it's really important you take parents on this journey so that they understand and they can ask questions at home that support what's going on in the classroom. 
Uh, Greg, um, you have uh, shared similar experiences in Asia uh, with Shanna. What do you tell the parents uh, or, or even the students uh, with these expectations that they, they must call nine distinctions? You know, I, I don't read about such things in, in the UK or US, uh, but in Asia, there's these high expectations for high achievers, uh, but they lack uh, critical thinking. Uh, they lack uh, general knowledge. I've, in, my, in my job, okay, I've interviewed a lot of uh, high achievers, high achievers in codes, okay? And where there was this particular case I asked someone who scored very well, and at that time, uh, there was these uh, riots in the, in the UK, uh, we had racial riots, and he had no idea what I was talking about, okay? Because uh, obviously that he does not follow the news, he has, he has zero general knowledge, and when was asked for his opinion, uh, he, he could not say anything. In fact, as an interviewer, uh, when job applicants, job applicants come before me, I ask them to tell me, tell me something about yourself. They could not go beyond their name, their hobbies. And they found that it was actually very tough to talk about yourself. And, uh, but they were 9 A's, 10 A's, high achievers. Uh, this seems to be an Asian uh, kind of obsession. Uh, share with us your views on this. I agree, and you're right. We've worked in many different countries of the world. Um, we can brag about helping many children get into Harvard, uh, Cambridge, some of the finest universities in the world. And they're really, really smart. But also I can share research that says that at the end of one year at an Ivy League university in the US or UK, there's an incredibly large percentage of children that fail in spite of the academic grades they received at A-levels or when they finished high school. Yes, there's a cultural adaption issue, but they need to learn differently. Um, we think it's really important for parents and children to understand the long game, not just the short game. That's great that you got really good academic results at the end of your high school certificate, but what's life going to be like three or four years down the track when you've actually been at Harvard University? My best friend in the world is a Harvard MBA graduate, and he reminds me they don't do exams. They don't mm. do assignments. They do very practical hands-on projects. So it's a real change in direction. So if you've been to a traditional school that's focused on what we call high stakes testing, you have a lot of trouble adapting in, in the, 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 the real world of, of fine universities. We, uh, I remember having a conversation with a, a student of ours that we, um, we helped uh, get into Oxford Imperial in, in the UK. And he said, I wish I could talk basketball. He said, I wish I could play basketball in English. He wasn't talking about language. He, he wanted to embrace himself in the culture. He wasn't able to connect. And I'm not sure about you, but I've got a lot of really, really smart friends. Some of them are fun to be around, but not all of them. It's what you do with your intellect that really makes a difference. Some Asian families, sadly, talk about ROI, return for investment. They spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on education. And what's the return? Well, the return should be someone that actually goes out and makes a difference in the world. I'm not sure about you, but I hope people don't judge me anymore by my year 12 certificate. At 51 years of age, I've hopefully accomplished a lot more than what those grades achieved. And I think this is what we need to help parents understand. The long game is actually having impact. And those are the things I know you're referring to. Shana, you teach at the Kingsgate International School. And you have said before that thinking skills is the top priority. Mm -hmm. uh, how do teachers at Kingsgate teach thinking skills? It's, th there's many layers to it. The first thing that they do is they create an environment where students feel safe to take calculated risks and safe to ask questions and safe to make mistakes. And once students feel safe to make mistakes, then they feel safer going out on a limb and trying something different. You know, like I said before, that, that foundation knowledge is important. But then getting students to think off the page, getting them to daydream about what happens next, you know, what, what kind of innovation, what kind of creation, what kind of, you know, what kind of discovery would help make the world a better place. So getting students brainstorming and getting them working together. Collaboration is such a key. We always tell students, you know, world leaders don't walk into a room with answers. They walk into a room with questions. And there, that's when they come up with great ideas that build on one another. So teaching students how to work together and how to be team players is such an important piece as well. How do you uh, prepare your students 
uh, to be ready for the new world. I mean, I'm from the old world, the conventional Asian thinking, you must be a doctor, you must be an engineer, you must be a lawyer, nothing more than that, okay? That must be a return from an ROI of a million ringgit, okay? Now, how do you be prepared our kids in your school? Is it safe for me to say that sometimes it's the parents we need to spend time with rather than the kids? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, but no, look, there's a catchphrase that you may hear in education circles, which is called growth mindset. It's the opposite of fixed mindset. Fixed mindset is um, having a very narrow pathway. So um, again, I hate to use generalizations, but to make a point, when we lived in mainland China, we commonly came across, uh, we were in very wealthy schools and we came across children who came from very wealthy families, their families from very big business. And when in the university application process, we would say to them, so why do you want to do finance at Oxford or, or Harvard or, or somewhere else? And they'd say, well, because my family is very wealthy and my family want me to manage their money. They're crazy rich. Look, there's new money all over Asia. We got the Beijing billionaires, the Taiwan tycoons, but the young family, they're old money rich. <laughs> and there's two steps to that process. First of all, that's a bad answer. Um, <laughs> your university doesn't want to hear that. But secondly, you need to have a bigger vision than that. The truth is you don't teach children to think differently out of a textbook. As Shanna said, it's the environment that creates this. So we create environments where there needs to be more than one answer and it's not yes or no. There needs to be more, multiple answers in terms of, well, but what if? And, and what if these obstacles faced you? I've often said that the greatest key to innovation is telling someone it, it's not allowed to be done in a normal way. Yes. And at Kingsgate and the other schools that we operate, we say to children, this is the task, but you're not allowed to do it in a normal way. Mm -hmm. And it challenges children to move around in a different way. We often talk about, in Kingsgate, we talk about Da Vinci. Da Vinci was a famous artist, yeah. but also an inventor. Why was he so successful? Because he brought together the art with science, maths, and technology. He was academically smart pragmatic he understood how the world worked in terms of mathematical and science but he was creative and he could invent and design things that people didn't even think were possible and that's the profile of a child that's going to succeed in the next generation not the ones with a fixed mindset but a growth mindset this is part of where we are right now with this learning curve from this pandemic and this virtual learning experience is you know we've been talking in education for so long about how the job that children will have when they're adults, children today, that job hasn't been invented yet. And so we need to prepare students to be lifelong learners and we need to prepare students so that they are on the innovative side of that job. And I think this has been really eye-opening for parents and especially as AI just continues to get stronger and improve and already you know, moving out a lot of positions um, in the world that people thought would be around forever. Now computers and robots have those jobs. So I, I think during this pandemic, this has been eye-opening for a number of reasons, but yet another one is just how fast things are moving and how fast things are changing. Shanda, how do you prepare students uh, who enter your schools, particularly among Asians, mm -hmm. including relations, how do you prepare them to be confident to be able to make a presentation, to speak confidently, uh, speak coherently, very clearly, mm -hmm. that uh, in front of thousands of people, because one of the biggest problem and shortcomings of Asian is that uh, they are afraid of making mistakes. They are afraid that people laugh at them. Yeah. So after your presentation at Kingsgate, where you says, are there any questions? I noticed through the uh, YouTube, YouTube video, there were only two persons who put up their hands and both were Caucasians, okay? <laughs> All the Asian parents were very quiet. I presume that they will only ask the questions after the presentation was over, mm -hmm. okay? And I think the same problem would probably be uh, what they call it, an issue among the Asian kids. How do you prepare themselves to be really confident to dare to ask questions? Never mind if anybody laughs at them. How do you tell them to do it? The most important layer is amazing teachers that actually teach students so that they're confident in what they're learning. You know, teachers who set very clear objectives. This is what we're doing today. And this is what success is going to look like. So here's what success looks like at the end of the class period. And as the class is going on, the teachers are asking students questions and, and letting them talk and letting them process their learning. So students are becoming more and more confident about the subject material 
because they have these amazing teachers who know how they learn best and also know when they need help and when they need more stretching exercises. So it's the environment, it's the incredible teachers, and it's students who are feeling confident about their own learning because they are experiencing these successes every day. And if I can add to, like, we yeah. tend to care and value what we put emphasis on. Mm -hmm. So we know that the, 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 I know we're stereotyping, but if we generalize about the parent profile you've just described, they care about the maths and science results, don't they? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, what they also need to care about is how much did my child contribute to class this week? Mm -hmm. how, how, how confident is my child now compared to what they were three months ago? So we run student-led three-way conferences at our school. So what happens is when children come to the end of the year and they get the report cards, the child conducts the interview with the parent and the teacher. They yeah. actually conduct the interview. They take charge of their own learning and say, look, I'm really good at this. And, I, and I, here's the piece of work that shows that I'm really good at that. But let me show you this other piece. I need to improve this other area of my work. Um, I need to improve my confidence. My teacher um, says that I do really well when I speak out and put my hand up and answer questions. Mm -hmm. So if we put it, if we shine a spotlight on it and value it, then children are going to be more motivated to do that. And this is why during those three-way conferences, by putting the student at the center of their own learning, you know, that, that's what's going to create a lifelong learner. You know, they can actually talk about how they learn best. They can actually talk about what's going on in all of their classes and set their own goals and be motivated learners. You know, and that's what we want. We want motivated, independent learners because that's what a lifelong learner is by definition. Interestingly, that uh, Kingsgate has signed up a virtual school partnership with a counterpart in South Korea. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, this is quite incredible. And we're really proud of it. We're proud of it for a couple of reasons. It's a great opportunity for us. But how it happened was that for the first time in history, parents got to see how our teachers teach every day, didn't they? Oh, okay. Um, because in a virtual environment, parents were looking over the shoulder of their children and they were seeing how their teacher teaches the child, which was a really positive thing for us um, because our teachers are really good at it. And the word got around that we were doing a great job around virtual learning. And a, fam a family was telling their counterparts in South Korea about our virtual schooling program and how successful it is and how, unlike many of the other schools, the parents are not complaining. They're really happy and excited about what we're doing. Mm -hmm. and we received a phone call one day from a, a, an investor group, investment group in South Korea that said, is it at all possible that we could replicate what you're doing? Could you deliver programs from Malaysia into South Korea? And of course, we said yes. And I know Shanna's been working on that diligently uh, for the last uh, three or four months. It's going to be quite exciting. It is exciting. And not only are they going to be coming into our classrooms and our teachers doing the virtual teaching for the students in South Korea, but we'll also be virtually training all of their teachers in South Korea as well. So we can you know, create teachers who, when the, when the screen is off, the teachers can keep building on that knowledge in authentic, meaningful ways. You mentioned that parents could uh, keep track or to follow these classes online. Uh, how is it done? Well, a lot of it is done because the parent is working next to the child because the parent's working from home. So the parent is overhearing so much. You know, just this past Saturday, the principal of our school had a parent meeting where he was talking to parents about what had been going on with online learning and you know the, the, the different initiatives that had taken place and what had worked and what we're gonna keep for next year and, and changes we've made next year based on what's been successful during this virtual learning time. And we'll also be doing uh, teacher training for those teachers in South Korea. So when the camera goes off, those teachers can keep the momentum going with creating and delivering those authentic, meaningful lessons. Okay, so the kids will not be terribly upset with this new approach. <laughs> no, well, we think it's going to be great. Um, I mean, the, the children here in Malaysia won't even know. Basically, <laughs> there's a virtual uh, platform set up um, and the children in South Korea will have um, access to our programs as well as an assistant teacher trained by our, our, our team here. Shannon and Greg, uh, give us one last uh, opinion of what would, would you tell uh, Malaysians, uh, teachers and Asians in general of how they should proceed or to cope with these many new approaches 
about online teaching and how they should really uh, respond to it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the first thing I would like to tell them is, you know, we, we've got to keep our students caught up. You know, it's, we, we, we need to keep them right on grade level. The idea that we're going to wait until next year, until it's back to face-to-face -face learning, it sets up too many students for failure. There are some students who really have a, a, a struggle and a real challenge keeping caught up with their regular schoolwork. So to put keeping up and catching up on top of one another, it's really, really difficult. So it's important as educators that we make sure that all students are keeping up with their grade level work and any holes or gaps that have been created during this virtual learning time, that those are quickly plugged and we keep driving and moving instruction forward. And that should always be the focus, you know, drive instruction forward and care about the well-being of each of our students and children. Right. I think the thing what I'd like to say is it's, it's about um, our attitude or way of thinking. Um, the truth is I'm 51 years of, old, of age and I've had to adapt as well. Yeah. The world's changed alone in my time. So parents are gonna to need to have an open mind the pandemic's been stressful for all of us at times. We've all had bad days, haven't we? Where we thought, when are we yeah. going to get to the end of this? This is really tough. Yeah. But we need to show our children resilience. We need to show our children that we're motivated and enthusiastic. We need to show them that the world is going to be better at the end of this because of what we learned. I mean, who would have thought about the changing careers, the way the world would have changed? It was a crisis that turned into opportunity. So we need to help our children embrace the opportunities this is going to provide. And if you're not sure about things being different, just acknowledge that you are of a different generation and you can't judge the current education system or the future growth from the experiences we had when we were children because things changed. I can only speak for us, but we are also quite tough on new innovations. We're innovative people, but we, we are all about maximising outcomes for children. Technology should only be used if it accelerates outcomes for children. We're really tough on the vendors that contact us on a daily basis trying to sell their wares. Mm -hmm. so, so parents too, stay discriminating. Stay focused and make sure that the tasks at hand are going to help your child. But be open to it and keep a really positive mindset about the future. And ask questions. If you have a question about something that's happening at the school, ask questions. You know, that, that, that's how we'll all learn more and get on the same page and create stronger school communities around Malaysia. Thank you so much, Greg and Shanna, for Thank reminding you. us that you ask questions because we are not my readers. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm, I've learned so much uh, from the two of you about the type of approaches that has been introduced in Malaysia, the kind of uh, new methods. It's really, really amazing. Uh, thank you so much for sharing these experiences. We hope to meet again uh, to talk more about education, which is something I'm very passionate about uh, because I also, I also teach at the um, National University of Malaysia once a month. Okay? And I know what it's really like to do an online teaching. It's really tough. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, Greg. Thank you, Shana, for sharing. Thank you so much. Uh, Please, uh, to followers around the world, please share and our share about our views on social media and do follow us. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Stay safe.